During the First World War, it became quickly apparent that heavy vehicles would be needed to break the stalemate of trench warfare. The Mark I, also known as the Landship, entered service in August 1916. It first saw action on the 15th of September that very same year, during the Battle of Flores Corset. After the battle, their strength and effectiveness, seen by all, tanks quickly became an integral part of modern combat. After World War II, tanks remained relatively unchanged, symbolising their combat effectiveness, but by the time of the resource crisis, which perhaps is a topic for another day, tanks were fast becoming less and less cost effective. August 2065 was when the US government would start the development of a replacement. It would have to be small, relatively agile, and be able to pack an equal amount of firepower, but most importantly, it had to be less resource heavy. Thus, powered combat infantry armour was born. In spite of many setbacks, West Tech revealed the first of many innovations the project would create. The TX-28 microfusion cell would be revealed to the world in the summer of 2066. The fusion cell was capable of generating up to 60,000 watts. In the winter of 2066, China invaded Alaska, starting the Sino-American War. But it wasn't until 2067 that units equipped with power armour were sent to the front lines to push back against the Chinese aggressors. This model was designated the T-45. The model had many problems such as a alarming power consumption rate. However, thanks to extensive field testing, many of the problems were fixed in later models of T-45. Not much is known about the T-45's armour plating. However, what we do know is that it is made out of steel. Therefore, we can assume that it is made out of level 4 ballistic steel. We can assume this because of the role that power armour units are supposed to fill in battle, which is the equivalent of tanks and other heavy vehicles. T-45's armour plating fits onto a universal frame, allowing for different models of power armour to fit onto the same frame. However, it is unclear how many post-war variants utilise this frame. In spite of its shortcomings, the T-45 stabilised the Alaskan front, thus proving that power armour is a crucial part of any military faction, pre or post-war. We keep adding to the list of achievements underneath the T-45's belt, the MP-47A prototype medic power armour was a prototype T-45. It closely resembled a T-45D on the surface, but it was no ordinary T-45D. It could administer medics to the user and surrounding troops. As well as administering medics to the user, it also featured an onboard voice module, which would sound alerts if it detected an enemy presence. Later, power armor frames would only keep the ability to inject chems to the user. By 2069, West Tech had secured a new contract for the development of power armor. This contract would help secure enough resources for the development of the T-51 line and would also become the largest military contract from the largest military contractor. Unlike the T-45, the T-51's armour is made out of a polylaminate composite, which is also coated in a 10 micron thick silver ablative layer, which allows for the reflecting of laser blasts and radiation emissions without damaging the composite's surface directly. Composite is capable of absorbing over 2.5 kilojoules of energy without damage. To cap it off, the organic design of the armour helps to deflect incoming projectiles. All T-51 helmets come with a drop-down aiming ocular and a forehead mounted lamp as standard issue. During its development at Fort Strong, users would keep losing their balance over rough terrain. To solve this issue, high-flow hydraulics, gyroscopic stabilizers, and shock absorbers were integrated into the universal frame. Doing this allows the suit to carry the bulk of the weight, which means that soldiers can carry heavier weapons into a battle. The gyroscopic stabilizers and shock absorbers would fix the fall-in problem as well. For optimal performance, the armor has to be custom fitted to the user's body. June 2076, T-51 units were sent to China where they quickly overcame the People's Liberation Army. One year later, General Constantine Chase used the T-51Bs to maximum effectiveness in the reclamation of Anchorage. This coincided with the introduction of the T-60 series of power armor. Originally just another model of T-45, the T-60 eventually became its own series after the US government decided that it was significantly different enough to the T-45. It was developed as a supplement to the hard-to-make T-51s. However, it was predominantly deployed in domestic environments instead of the front lines. 
The T-60 was also the last series of power armour to be mass produced. Not much is known about the T-65. What we do know is that it had radically different protection principles to previous series of power armour. It had separate pieces of armour stacked on top of each other, which led to a more consistently armoured suit over other series using a whole cast armour system. The only known place where T-65 was deployed was by the Secret Service at Vault 79. EX-17, or Excavator Power Armor, is the only suit of power armor intended for civilian use. Developed by Garium Mining Co., the suit was intended to help human miners compete with the ever-grown threat of robots taking their jobs. But when Hormright Mining Co. brought out Garium Mining Co., the suit of armor was discontinued, and production ceased. The X-Series was supposed to replace the T-Series, however, the X-Series only developed one suit of power armor the X-01. Its design philosophies were radically different to the T-series of armour. Although technically functional by late 2077, there was still a significant amount of problems inhibiting mass production. The armour was made out of a Strontium-90 based armour plating, but this improvement was not adopted by the armour schematics before the bombs dropped. After the Great War, power armour was one of a handful of technologies that were developed by post-war factions. The main innovator was the Enclave. The Enclave was a faction that was formed before the Great War. It was composed of high-ranking US officials like the President, who had survived the nuclear holocaust at the Poseidon oil rig. By 2198, the Enclave had just started working on their own take on power armor, but even for the almighty Enclave, it was a tremendous undertaking. Most of their initial attempts led to suits that were inferior to pre-war models. Eventually, in 2215, presidential order mandated the development of a successor to the X01, but it wasn't until 2220 that Advanced Power Armor Mark I was ready. It closely resembled X01, but without the prototype's flaws. The Mark I became the standard issue suit of power armor for Enclave soldiers. Advanced Power Armor Mark II was developed in 2246. It was supposed to supersede the Mark I, but thanks to the Chosen One destroying the Poseidon oil rig, this wouldn't happen until 2277. The Mark II is made out of a lightweight composite similar to the T-51. Unfortunately for the Mark II, it would not have much time in the limelight, because not too long after the Enclave arrived at Adams Air Force Base, Enclave scientists developed the Hellfire Powered Combat Infantry Armor. Hellfire Power Armor is the most powerful suit of armor in the Wasteland, but before it could become standard issue for Enclave troops, the Lone Wanderer and the Brotherhood of Steel attacked Adam's Air Force Base, scattering the Enclave once more. It is unclear when Raider Power Armor was first made, however by 2287 it was commonly used by Raider Gans in the Commonwealth. Due to its ramshackle design, Raider Power Armor cannot take much punishment. This means it is only used by factions that do not have the capacity to repair suits of power armor. And since Raider Gowns are the largest faction capable of obtaining power armor but not repairing it, the armor became quickly synonymous with them. If there is an icon on your screen, please click it. It is the follow up video I will inevitably have to make. If there is any information I left out, please let me know so I can add it to the follow up video. Just quick before this video ends, I'd like to throw my friend Montgomery Tricks, he provided all the Fallout 76 gameplay, I'll link his Instagram in the description below. If you enjoyed the video, please do all the things that YouTubers won't shut up about, and I will see you in the next one. <laughs>